Hello and welcome to the third Scholars and Artisans of Darton discussion um, with our, our scholar today and artisan today is Peter of Smithfield. Um, just before we get into the full introduction of Peter, um, this is the series of discussions is to highlight to members of the Shire the depth and range of expertise within the Shire of Darton in case uh, any of our members are wanting inspiration or advice in learning a new skill. Um, it can be, it's easy to not realise what people know and this way I hope to highlight each, well, each month a new scholar and artisan and get to know them better and what they know better and hopefully encourage interest in the arts and sciences since I am now the arts and sciences officer and that's my job. All right. Peter of Smithfield. Mundanely Between... Peter makes swords for Wetter Workshop with his work featuring in many famous movies. Doubtless you'll have seen his movie, his his swords in action. He also has experience in jousting. Welcome, welcome, Peter. Actual famous. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, just I have a series of questions. If you have questions afterwards, you can stick them in the chat, and I will get to them. Or you can pipe up when I ask if anyone wants any, has any questions. Okay, first question. What drew you to your art, Peter? Okay, um, you got to go back to the dim, dark depths of the early 1980s. <clears throat> yep. Uh, or me? <laughs> before you. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm that vintage, early 1980s. Yeah. Yep. So that was just the, the very early days of reenactment of all sorts in New Zealand. Mm. And uh, we learned very quickly that you just can't buy anything. Yeah. There's no internet, there are very few books, yeah. and so actually getting any sort of equipment was really difficult. So uh, I got into I got into making weapons and armor out of a general interest in making stuff, but also because there was a need, because yeah, the only way to make stuff, well, get stuff was often to make it yourself, and that meant whatever skills and equipment people could bring, they did which yeah. often wasn't very much. <laughs> learning, is, learning is a good thing though, is it? Yep. Oh yeah, so it was definitely on the job learning. That's right. Okay, so, so necessity drew you rather than particular interest in yeah. sports? Well, interest, I was interested in history. Yeah. But, um, it was necessity because otherwise we just couldn't get anything. Yeah. Like one of our, one of my early treasured things was a one sheet that I got from a guy in England that was making helmet bowls and a few other bits and pieces mm. and like just even finding people was was a challenge like it's, people don't appreciate how easy it is today that with the internet and everything it's just yeah connection is so easy living in the future has its definite benefits yeah <laughs> yeah which is ironic isn't it <laughs> a little bit a little bit um was uh, sword making something you expected to like um, I, I enjoyed handcrafting anyway. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I sort of got drawn into weapons and armor, like swords in particular. Uh, I made armor because there was a bit of call for it, but um, swords actually were the things that most attracted me because they were, they're intriguing because they're, um, they're quite complicated things in terms of function. Mm. Like, They've got to be light, um, they've got to be strong, they've got to be durable. Mm. Like, you know, today if we break a sword, it's like, oh, bugger, I broke a sword. But in period, if you broke a sword, that could be the end of you. Yeah. If it wasn't on the practice field, that could be the end of you. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, they were really important tools. And and a lot of, um, a lot of requirements that are competing against each other. Oh. Like you can make a sword strong and heavy, or you can make it light and fast, or various combinations of the above, but to try and get all of those, that's really, really difficult. Yeah. 
Um, just as an aside, was it what sort of were you doing metalwork when you said you were interested in crafting before you got into sword making? Sort of. Was it well, I'd only done secondary else? school. Yeah, I'd only done secondary school metalwork before that, but I'd enjoyed it. I just had no equipment to start with. <laughs> yeah. Like to give you an idea of how crude it, my initial setup was, it was um, you know those picnic benches. My initial workshop was a picnic bench that I threw a tarp over, and then I graduated to a woodshed. Yeah. And then to a garage. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. And now so you got like off the garage. Yeah, and I own it. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, nice. All right. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I have, I think, intermediate level wood, metal work. I did a little bit of woodwork, but that's because I went to a girls' school and there was not a whole lot of metal work and woodwork at high school available, apart from one term. But um, it is satisfying to make a thing, isn't it? Oh, very. Yeah. And also, especially something that's durable. Yeah. Like, like you know, I know that some of the stuff that I've made is probably still going to be around in several hundred years, long after I'm gone and turned to mulch. Yeah. Yeah. And also it's something that good, you, your work literally gives pleasure to, you know, millions of mm. people. Yeah. That, that's actually one of the cool things that yeah. I didn't appreciate enough for a long time. Yeah. Lots of people are like, it's so pretty. Cool. Anyway, okay, great. So um, that seems like a good segue. What keeps you interested? Okay, I'm a perfectionist, uh -huh. which is which is my strength and it's my weakness. Fellow perfectionist here, I hear you. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so always trying to do better, trying to perfect the object, trying to perfect the process. Um, just, yeah, so if I even if I'm making multiples of the same thing, at least it gives me a chance to uh tweak the process and just learn better ways of doing stuff yeah yeah and then you get and you get faster as well as better yeah that too ideally yeah and then you... um, or, or as i call it fucking up this often <laughs> this is an adult podcast we don't need to yeah um bleep anything fortunately <laughs> Oh, that's good. Ed editing editing host says no. <laughs> I'm not going to make things so curse away. Um, so okay, so perfection, the, the pursuit of perfection keeps you interested. What surprised you about sword making? Um, very good question. Um, the number of things there were to learn, I guess. Like you look at a sword and you think a sword is a sword is a sword piece of metal that's been banged around a bit yeah exactly it's a lump of metal but swords do different jobs in different ways um some are made for defeating armor some are for lightweight slicing um thrusting long swords short swords mm. heavy swords all sorts so i guess it's the variety of swords and and also yeah that the, there are more different types of swords to out there in the world through history than you could possibly ever make in a lifetime yeah well, like, an awful some lot of them are very yeah some of them are very specialized skill sets so so like japanese swords for example yeah making the blades is a five-year apprenticeship in mm. japan polishing the blades is another five-year apprenticeship making the hilt components they're, they're their own apprenticeship so like yeah literally if you do it by the book there's nobody nobody really can do all of that before they run out of life yeah and that's just one one form of sword yeah so it's just there's always something else out there to learn about if you want to but again it's a rabbit hole how much of your life do you do you have to devote to a a, a new little thing yeah you know, an aspect of the craft yeah you have to decide yeah are you going to go wide or you're going to go narrow yep. and deep yeah yep. and and for me i was sort of lucky because my my hobby which was medieval reenactment meant that medieval european swords were basically my thing yeah and that's been my default and i've expanded out from that but it's sort of the form of sword that i really understand the most mm. 
what's the most useful skill you've learnt? Um, well, I guess you could say sword making, because it's my living. Yes, mundanely, that is very useful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if we go over the most useful maker. skill you've made, the most useful skill you've learnt as a sword maker. <laughs> yep. Um, sword grind, uh, blade, well, grinding blades, basically. I've gotten really good at it. Yeah. Like, um, I do all my grinds handheld. I don't use a tool rest because I got to a point where if I'm doing a blade that's anything out of a, a simple shape, that the tool rest gets in the way. So mm -hmm. I stopped using it. What, what, what part of the process is the grinding? Um, okay, well, essentially with, okay, you can forge or you can grind out a blade, yeah. but whichever way you still have to finish the blade. And I do most of that on a belt grinder mm. and I've been practicing for 40 years. So I'm getting reasonably good now. <laughs> yeah. Your apprenticeship's nearly over. Pretty much. And training up a newbie to replace me. Oh yes, 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 yes. Right, so, so once you've forged it, so e even if it's been forged, you still have to do a yep. certain level of grinding to it. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So even if you, whether you forge it or rough grind it before the heat treating, then there's still a lot of finished grinding to get. It's an it's the old 80-20 paradigm. 80% of your time is spent removing the final 20% of the material. Because mm. it's got to be done just right or, you know, one slip at the wrong moment can really mess it up. Yeah. And at that point, sword making is a reductive process. So if you remove the wrong bit, there's no going back. <laughs> you have to melt it back down again and... Mm, yeah, or, or you make a different sword out of it. Yeah. And swear a bit. Yeah, there's been some of that too. <laughs> Excellent. All Lots right. Of that actually. <laughs> What's the hardest or most challenging thing you've learned? The hardest thing? Um, well, yeah, the most challenging thing is actually the grinding. Um, yeah. Because you can grind. It's one of those weird things that the closer you get to perfection, the more your flaws show up. Yeah. Um, so, so when a blade has a lot of imperfections, which is what I was doing in the early days, it was sort of like they all sort of blended together to get a look. But now that I'm getting blades really, really accurate, um, it means that every little imperfection shows up. Mm. So that, that's the difficult thing is actually those final 2%. Yeah. Also, as you know more, you would see more imperfections, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, I, I wince when I look at st the stuff that I made early on. Well, it's a sign you've grown. <laughs> Yeah. There, yeah, there's one or two scenes in Lord of the Rings where um swords get spectacular close ups and like I'm look I'm the person who sits there looking and think, I wish I'd ground that better. Because <laughs> I can see things. Oh dear. Yeah. This is where you, this is where um also the, the progress of filmmaking technology is not helping either. Oh no, no. Um yeah, high resolution just makes things harder and harder to hide. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so this this next question, I think, is a fairly obvious answer um, in that you have your your mundane yeah. job. It's, it's weird because my mundane job is is sort of yeah the, my skill set. Yeah, but has it perhaps has it is there anything else that your that your skill set your sword making has helped with, whether mundane or, in the SCA? Well, it all comes back to sword making, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like I make swords. It's, yeah. That's what I do. No, no, uh, no, nothing particularly transferable that you, you use in other things. I mean, you've you've, you've got metalwork skills that you've. I know you've. Yeah. Got, oh, got oh I do. Weeding. Yeah, I mean, I've done. I do general stuff like I can weld a thing. I can smash a thing into a shape. Yeah. Um, some better than others. A sword shape. <laughs> or, or just general metalwork. Yeah. Like I'm not a blacksmith, but I can do blacksmithing. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I just know how to 
um, persuade metal to do what I want it to do some of the time. Mm. Or, or brute force at the rest of the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that my old four pound hammer I used to call the persuader. <laughs> I like it. Mm, mm, yes, very persuasive. All right, so you're stuck on a desert island. Oh, yeah. Artistic yeah. Retreat of One. Which mm -hmm. five tools are you taking with you? Um, okay, well, I thought of this as, you know, your classic dumped on a desert island thing. So I thought yeah. maybe it might have been a bit of a survival situation. Yeah. So my first thing is a big Bowie type survival knife. Yeah. Um, not an axe because with those big knives you can actually use them as an axe not by swinging them but you stick them against a bit of wood and then you smack them with another with a bit of wood mm. and you actually can chop down saplings and stuff quite well so yeah it means you don't need an axe right the second thing would be a trenching tool mm -hmm. because you want to dig holes yep make shelter stuff like that for say the um, speed water to go around you rather than over you yep yep yeah. Um, something for collecting water, so your old classic survival thing of um, cellophane and a little stone to create a, a drip point and capture that in a cup. Yeah. Probably matches. Um, if I needed it, I'd probably get an emergency locator beacon. Useful. Yes, if it was that sort of situation. Yeah. What if it was just, if, if we take it from being, you've not been shipwrecked, Okay. But you've been put on an island and told, Peter, you're making swords. Mm -hmm. We're not letting you off until you've made us. Oh, okay. A bunch of well, what what case, would be your most essential tools? A fully equipped workshop. <laughs> I mean, seriously, <laughs> without, <laughs> without that, I'm not making a sword. Yeah. Uh, yeah, failing that, a box of books. To yeah. fill the time while I wait for people to pick me up. <laughs> Pragmatic. Yeah, yeah excellent. Okay, um, that, so following on from that, I'd had the thought, I don't believe it's in my questions, but um, in terms of period tools, so of course you do your, your art mundanely and yep. in the SCA, in terms of the period tools used, how have they changed? It was, I mean, um, apart, but apart from the power oh, tools. A lot. A grinders lot. presumably okay. ground, grinding was done somehow yeah well in period a lot of the work was done with scrapers so for example you'd, you'd um, forge a blade to shape heat treat it and then you would do some rough grinding on a grindstone yeah and then a lot of your stuff like fullering was sometimes done with scrapers or you would you'd use a different stone that's shaped to form a, a fuller so yeah. there was a lot of handwork and the same with cross guards, pommels, hilt components. So yeah. lots of stuff like that. So a lot of stuff really has changed. One of the big things is abrasives. Like these days, we've got so many specialist abrasives that speed things up. Mm. I, I can probably finish a blade in a third or so of the time that it would have taken in period. Yeah. And that's because I've got We've got stuff like uh, linishes with different size contact wheels, flat plates, um, ceramic, ceramic grinding belts, diamond coated grinding belts, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, drill bits is drill bits. It's just our drill bits today are higher precision. Mm. Like in period, a drill bit was a lot of work to make. Files were a lot of work to make. Um, so yeah, really what's happened is the equipment today is more refined Yeah. and we've got a trickery. Yep. And, Don't yeah, need a mule yeah. running round and round and round. No, no. Your grinder. Nope. Nope. Well, like we're in, say in period, you needed either a water powered or animal powered system to get the, you know, to give you the power to do the stuff. Today we just flick a switch and we've got electric motors and yeah. air and sometimes hydraulics. Mm -hmm. So when you were saying the fullering tools and things and scrapers, is that yeah. stone or is that tools made of them themselves? Yeah. Okay. Your, your classic medieval grindstone yeah. was something like four to six feet in diameter. And um, 
and say if you're sharpening so you, you definitely move the sword not the stone <laughs> oh yeah 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 and in fact some of the some of the um stone some of the grinders would actually lie on a platform above the stone so yeah. they could get the the right sort of pressure on the blade yeah and there's even pictures of people right up to about 1900 doing that yeah as a job like there's a really cool photo that i've found that which actually has like a, a line of these people above these big grindstones grinding yeah. blades of some sort and um they've even got they've got dogs that are there to lying on them to keep them warm so yeah so mm. it, it just makes me appreciate how much things have got better <laughs> the dogs here for fun now rather than for necessity yeah 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 um would you be able to find that image Ooh, or and send it to me later and then i can put it up mm, or link I'll to it or something look. yeah i have a feeling that it's going to be awkward to find um okay the other thought i had was oh what did i have thought on that um so what if, if you had a stone tool would that be the swordsmith's job to make the tools as well Monday, oh, the, the metal tools yeah i'm not sure about grindstones i i have a feeling that those were um those were um made another, by other crafts another 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 particular trade or, oh, or oh. skill yeah hang on a sec Where's that picture? there it is well can you share the screen blade gr yeah do a search on a thing called blade grinding with dogs and here's the picture coming up yeah i'll put it in chat okay okay and i will share my screen okay so that others can see this did as well oh yeah you did yeah oh so, yeah yeah yep now this is the sort of stuff that <laughs> really makes me appreciate how much times have changed yeah so what, what, where is this from um let's have a look i'm not just trying to see let's see there's a pot belly stove it's probably autumn or winter by the look of it i don't see electric motors as such yeah i wouldn't be surprised if this is like 1880 to 1920 yeah but yeah we've got one two dots oh, see on the back wall yeah big round thing this one that's here. one of the there that's one of the grindstones oh wow okay yep so would they all be working on the same stone or would there be separate stones no they would be separate stones so there's probably a there'll be a long shaft that's oh, several feet below them probably there's probably a, actually a floor underneath here which is where the stones are set up and they're actually working through holes yeah and are the stones turning yep yep okay. they're probably all on a common shaft oh, i think there's a hole in the middle of that one yeah they could be on common shafts or they could be separately powered and this would this could be one of those um in the period before individual electric motors you'd often have a a main power source yeah and everything would be driven with leather belts off pulleys yeah so some um, horse have had to turn something yeah possibly water powered yeah interesting cool oh, yeah yeah but also you look at the you look at the setup there and it's like yeah but it's um pretty hard work right i will stop sharing that now that's exciting i'll um make a note of that and stick that in the video description so that people can find that and have a closer mm. look at it at some point cool okay next question um So what's the best non-standard tool you've found? Mm, okay, not exactly a tool, but it's um, it's a it's a technique. Okay, this take this needs a bit of explanation. Okay, commonly things like sword hilts today are put together with resins. Mm. You know, historically, like in the Middle Ages, it would often be pitch or a, a pitch blend. Today we use um, things like high strength resins. Yeah. But I had I've had these problems, and so the, uh, pretty much everyone who makes swords has this problem occasionally. 
and it doesn't matter if they're low end or high end swords it, there are reports of it which is that you start hearing a little clicking noise inside the hilt yeah because what's happened is that the glue has separated from the tang mm. or from somewhere else and it's either done something like created an air pocket that pops or the glue is starting to break down as from mechanical movement yeah um because uh, the tang of a sword actually even within the grip try, wants to try and move a little bit yeah and the problem with problem with resins is that they're not actually glues for steel they're actually gap fillers yeah and this bugged me because when you're doing high-end swords and it's a sword that's assembled and it's not going to come apart easily because it's not screwed together it's it's pinned together and glued and everything mm -hmm. um fixing stuff like that is a big deal there are some there are a few cheats of yeah. for getting reducing the problem but i actually worked out went back to first principles and, and tried to figure out is there a better way of doing this and so this is actually probably would also come into your dirty hacks thing. yeah <laughs> and it's something that not i don't think many sword makers have thought of but it, it worked for me because of where i work we use a lot of urethanes yeah like you know, castable two-part urethanes for making um things like uh cast swords for background shots and things mm. uh, the most common thing is called cc60 which is a 60 shore hardness um urethane so it's it's a medium hardness but it's got a bit of flexibility and the thing is that i found out that urethanes were originally developed as glues for mm. woodworking mm. yeah and so i did some tests so classic test was um get make wood slats but get bits of steel roughen the surface on a linisher so they've got um, contact area and then i resin glued wood bits on and then i with other ones i used there's a there's a primer that goes with the urethane that sticks to steel really well and then the urethane sticks really well to the primer mm. and the urethane sticks really well to the wood anyway and so my test was basically get a chisel or something and try and pry this off and i would pop off the the resin one literally when it gave it just popped off like a whole sheet yeah and delaminated and the urethane was stronger than the wood I was ripping the wood apart and and it was the urethane was holding the remnants of the wood yeah so yeah that's become my thing and haven't had a problem since excellent yes no mysterious clicking noises nope no and uh yeah it's something that yeah maybe a few other sword makers have run across it but it's become uh yeah it's become one of my little tricks cool okay um so yes guilty pleasures dirty hacks so dirty yep, hack is it. urethane urethanes yep. yep um it's not a yeah except i wouldn't call it a dirty hack because it's not a cheat it's actually it's actually better than industry standard yeah which is interesting it's one of those classic problems that everyone uses resins because everyone knows resins mm. even though they're actually not the best thing for that job yeah hmm okay um what advice would you give a newbie in your art form oh that's okay apart from the obvious the obvious one of don't do this for a living <laughs> oh the classic thing There's is only I've so had, many I've, we can have yeah well it's well actually that's part of it too but yeah. i've literally had people ask me so how do i do what you do you know, yeah. how do i do what you've managed to do and, and actually make a living out of this and and unfortunately for most people the answer is you don't yeah um it's a really really hard road and you're not going to make a lot of money out of it most of the time i'm mm. i am very fortunate that i've i'm in an industry that actually pays yeah um most people even high-end sword makers and scabbard makers and armorers and people like that their hourly rates are often terrible Mm. for the skill level they've got so yes yeah, so my first advice is don't yeah but if you're going to first of all um don't don't jump in to try and do it for a living do it as a hobby yep uh make a lot of mistakes learn from them um you will uh, you will make mistakes that's a given 
Yeah. Uh, and even even with, well, well, even with even with all the resources that are available for learning now, you're still going to make lots of mistakes. Yeah. And like, there's only so much you can pick up from a book. Um, yeah. Learn from people that are that have done it. So the obvious thing there is um, pay to do things like pattern welding courses and sword making and knife making and things like that. Because uh, whatever it costs you, you will save more from not going down all those dead ends. Yeah. In terms of time, resources. Yep. yep. If you put any value at all on your time, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, and so in, the, in that case, if you're giving a newbie, uh, so it's just someone who wasn't wanting to do this as a <laughs> job, as a career, yeah. if they're just, just a hobbyist, then it would still be go mm -hmm. on all the courses. Yeah, yeah. Figure out what you want. Also, figure out what you want to do because you can't do everything. So concentrate on something, the thing that particularly interests you. And a couple of years down the track, the thing that interests you may not be what interests you today even. Mm. So choose, no, choose a type of sword from a particular yeah. place or particular mm -hmm. place and the swords they made. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you pick the thing that you know that you're interested in, you'll always put more effort into it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that's probably about it. Okay. What I mean, helps? There's a, there's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. But that's a starter. That's a starter. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is the they come up to you in the bar and they've summoned their courage. And they're not quite your yeah, yeah. they're not quite your uh, protege yet. Not quite your apprentice. Not quite. not quite. Um. So what helps if you're stuck with ideas? Um. Well, I Google stuff. Pinterest is useful for lots of images but mm. facebook feeds and youtube like yeah. again these days the resources are all out there like all the stuff that back in the back in the bad old days people talked about trade secrets and stuff like that but really there are no secrets that you can't learn now mm. unless you're getting super specific like what is the temperature of the water that you should be quenching your katana blade into yeah that sort of stuff comes down to each smith has their own little secrets yeah but but if you want to know how to make a sword how to make a knife how to pattern weld everything is out there in fact mm. you could spend all your time watching videos and stuff <laughs> and not making anything yeah. if you really wanted to yeah have the, have the imaginary sword you're making yeah yeah cool um and so and what i'm saying is the ideas is that in terms of designs for swords or ways to do a thing better all, all sorts of things like mm -hmm. i've picked up some really good ideas off facebook and youtube people showing their little tricks for doing certain things yeah and so i've picked up ideas that are like and it's one of those classic things sometimes it's like huh okay you i'll spend half as much time and do this job better and why did i never think of that before i hate that one because it, it's that thing of once you've seen it it's so painfully obvious yeah yeah uh, okay um what medieval item that gives you joy and delight do you wish people would pay more attention to hats 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 um, I think to quote that Monty Python thing, the world needs more hats. Hats are great. Yeah. I have an imaginary ANS officer hat. It's mm -hmm. got sequins and bells. Yep. Yep. Um, is there anything in particular about hats that you enjoy, apart from the world needing them? Um, oh, well, I'm very sun sensitive, so yeah. I'm always wearing a hat when I'm out in the sun. But yeah. Ginger, hats. me too. Yep. <laughs> But also hats, um, you can you can go completely over the top with hats if you want. Mm -hmm. Literally bells and whistles. Yeah, I've got a jester hat somewhere with bells on it. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Uh, do you have a favourite hat, or just the well, indispensable to you? Well, my my own favourite hat is just my floppy felt hat that I wear when I'm doing pretty much everything the one's got badges all over it yeah so yeah so that one's just general sun hat it's uh flopped in the right ways over the years so it takes me from the sun and uh i've pulled out all my extra badges so now i can add enough weight that the wind won't blow it away oh nice yep 
yep that's that's very useful um that's considering the, the the location of, of data hmm. and a certain yeah. propensity for wind okay um what are some common misconceptions about your art form Ooh, where to begin common ones so, swords in general or making swords making swords i think okay okay we'll there are so many one. there are so there are so many myths and misconceptions about swords themselves but about making swords um because think about your art rather than your yeah, than, than okay. what they are. yeah one of the big things that i run into is that there are lots of people that have said i'd love to make swords but what they're mostly saying nine times out of ten is that they they like i want to learn to make a sword then move on yeah whereas when i'm looking for somebody to teach i'm like i want somebody who's interested in doing this for their career yeah because um you know it's that thing of i value my time too mm. and also training somebody to be good at anything like that takes a lot of work yeah so it's the difference between somebody who loves the object and or you know there's a there's a myth and romance around swords but mm. the thing is you've got to love the process mm. rather than just the object yeah or else getting to the process getting through the process well, is a chore well if it becomes a chore you just won't yeah exactly and then those people realize uh, and hopefully they don't invest too much of their life before they realize that actually this isn't what i want to do well it's pretty much anything isn't it <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah Mm -hmm. Okay, um, do we have time for one quick misconception about swords? Um, swords go shing when you pull them out of the scabbard. They go ting and shine. Ding. Yep, that too. Yeah. What do yeah. they do? Oh, do they... Only in movie land. Well, if it's going shing coming out of the scabbard, it means something that's something is rubbing. Yeah. Metal on metal. So ideally a sword the inside of a scabbard is wood, sometimes lined with wool or felt or something. Yeah. And uh, a sword should come out without making a sound. But of course, if you're making a movie, that doesn't, um, you need sound to help sell what's going yeah. on. So that's why every sword today goes shing. Yeah. Because they're deliberately it, it, making scabbards badly. Yeah. It's like that thing about armor. Yeah. Armor doesn't protect you. It's just a form of costume. Yeah. Well, look at all the people that in movies that wear plate armor and mail, and the first thing that hits them, they fall over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you wanted to talk about um, things that bug me about films, that armor is the number one armor that doesn't actually do its job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this is uh, this is an SCA podcast, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, well at least in the SCA you know that armor does its job because if yeah. it doesn't people fall over yeah and and we don't want them falling over from hurt we want them falling over and oh I'm dead yes and now I resurrect yep exactly yeah, yeah. um it, it spoils the fun if they fall over from actual hurt mm. yeah. okay um what would you say is the best idea you're working on and why okay I couldn't really talk about any film stuff I'm currently working on anyway, <laughs> no. but the, the thing that actually is giving me the most inspiration at the moment is um, my family's been bugging me for years about making a family sword. Yeah. And of course they want me to do it before I die because doing it after I die, yeah, that's got complications. Um, <laughs> unless I come back as a lich. Um, but anyway, so yeah, family sword. So it's got me thinking about what is a sword that sort of isn't isn't kitsch or cliche, but yeah. sums up the lion family. Yeah. So thinking about, I've been thinking about that and twiddling with designs. Yeah. And if I have a bit of spare time, I'll start on it. Yeah. And it won't go shing. No. May not even have a scabbard. Yeah yeah all right um what so what ex so basically the family the art that you're working on that excites you now is the family sword mm -hmm. yeah um is there anything else that excites you in your art that you're allowed, able to tell us there are well in the work i do mostly i'm concentrating on process now 
yeah because because you know i can do the work well enough mm. it's about getting the process refined and doing multiples to the same standard yeah it's actually one of the hardest things about sword making particularly with the collectible swords i'm doing from lord of the rings is actually making each sword the same yeah making making a bunch of swords that are similar is not difficult but making swords that are really really to a pattern that's actually quite complicated to do it as yeah. a repeat job um but in terms of stuff i'd like to get into probably pattern welding is still the thing i would like to do if i ever have ever have the free time and energy mm. that you learn? cool okay um i know you mentioned at the biggest start that basically the pursuit of perfection is what keeps you interested yes. How do you avoid boredom or burnout in that? Yeah, that's, that's actually a question that I just couldn't come up with an answer to because yeah. I've been pretty close at times. Yeah. Um, and again, it's it's the curse of the perfectionist. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, one of my mottos that I used to use quite a lot, which mm -hmm. I still roll out occasionally, was perfection is adequate that was where i started back in the 80s that was yeah. that was like i didn't want to make the most swords or um yeah or share quantity i just wanted to make the best yeah and of course that gets you sometimes into corners that are quite difficult to get out of where nothing's ever quite good enough yeah so, you're just starting out what you're able to produce is not going to be what's in your head no, no, yeah. that was frustrating. But then as I got better, there was always that thing of, yeah, I'm, I'm 95%, but that still means 5% to go sort of thing. Yeah. So you have to say that 5% that... can happen next time. Well, yeah, or over the next few years. Yeah. It's, it's a very slow process. So yeah, perfectionist, trying to get perfection or at least improvement is, um, is one of the ways I avoid boredom is because I'm, I'm so much into the process. Yeah. Um, and I guess the burnout way to avoid is... burnout is to have new things to do. Yeah. And like, like there are things in the sort of more of a jewelry side of it, like um, silver work and things like that, that I'd like to do more of. Mm. But then when you get into that, there's so much stuff you can to, do in terms of decoration of, yeah. of swords and hilts and things like that so that's the sort of stuff that i i like fiddling a bit with but then looking for the opportunity to actually make use of it yeah yeah so, so yeah always looking for the next thing but at the same time keeping in mind that the thing i'm working on is uh is my living currently. yeah yeah that's the thing is if you if you want to make work on something then you have to find a movie that wants that particular aesthetic yeah yeah or i'm using the family sword as an excuse to try out a few things <laughs> or some some materials like um uh silver putty Ooh. um oh you've never heard of it no no it's something I didn't know that silver I could be putty. okay <laughs> it, it, me. <laughs> it, it's a very it's a putty that's very silver rich yeah and then you burn off the the matrix and you're yeah. left with pure silver yeah so essentially you form it like putty without yep. all the complexities that might go with normal silver work and then you burn off the the, un, the rest of it and then hopefully what you've got is a nice silver piece of jewelry okay or a, or a setting for stone or something yep. so yeah i want to play with things like that fun all right yeah. i have that's the end of my questions um i have been sent one more question so mm -hmm. um while i while yeah. i ask that one and um so while I ask that one, if you have any questions, let me know in the chat or pipe up in a minute. But while we uh, while we wait for that, we'll ask this one. This is from Nick. Do you always try to build a sword to a historic style, or do you sometimes try to create novel styles? Um, I used to do lots of historical swords, but since I since uh, work in the film industry, most of my swords would be classed as either practical fantasy or fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, like Lord of the Rings, the swords had historical parallels, but they were trying to be different things. So I'd say that my current thing is mostly practical fantasy, mm. where if I'm given a drawing and I'm given leeway to um, 
make it the way I'd like a sword to be make, mm. made is that I'm trying to make a sword that even with the fantasy elements or decoration and things like that, that it still is a reasonably functional weapon mm. if it's sharpened. Yeah. Or a reasonably fictional, effective mm. bludgeoning tool. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so I'm always still trying to draw things towards a more practical end of the spectrum rather than the, mm. some of these things like, oh, the classic one is the Conan sword. Yeah. I love that sword, but it's not a very practical weapon. It's short and it's heavy. Yeah. It, it, it's a beater. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, so you take what you can, but generally it's fantasy with maybe a bit of a historic mm. inspiration yep. at times yeah yeah to a large degree and you know then then there are things like my ideas for the family sword which is going to have some historical parallels but i'm not trying to make a historical sword there i'm trying to make a high-end sword a high-end sword yeah though so the other though one other sometimes i do actually get to make historical swords like mm. one is that i recently got to well over a period of about a year bit by bit making a uh, a basket hilted broadsword and dirk for the actor graham mctavish for, for his family sword nice yeah so that was a, a thing i i had only ever made one basket hilted sword before that and it was a, a fairly simple one so yeah. it was a chance for me to to learn more about the forms the size the size of the basket how it all worked and yeah and that so that was a fascinating little project learned a few things about why you don't do things certain ways <laughs> they'll work but you just take longer yeah things that it's that classic thing of it seemed like a good idea at the time but no it wasn't there's a reason why other people don't do that yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was fun. Cool. All right. Um, has anybody else got any questions? Anyone else present? I'm not seeing anything happen in the chat. Looks like we've been must have been thorough. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, in that case, um, I'll, uh, there seems to be a lot of the notes I've been making as been talking seem to have a theme of P, of Peter, and yes. that it is um, the, it's about the process, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you have a persuader in the pursuit yep. of perfection. Yes, exactly. For Peter of Smithfield. Yep. So uh, thanks very much, Peter, for giving us time yep. and knowledge mm. and basically if someone wants to know more about sword smithing and they actually want to learn how to make swords rather than just the one or if they want to make a sword and want a, a hint or even a, an expert yep. eye how would they be in touch with you uh so the little thing on is YouTube. Um, Facebook page probably. Yeah. Yep. So you'll find me there, Peter Lyon, on Facebook. Yep. Or I can give you my email if people really want to be in touch with me and yeah. ask questions. Yep. yep. Um, and I don't mind getting I don't mind getting emails from people. Cool. Um, so if you want to, we can put that in the in the description. Sure thing. If you want to. Um, and that sounds awesome. So thank you very yep. much. Yep. Thank you for having me.